I'm Karen Bosick with Iron Sun Valley, and we have a special treat today. We're joined by a man of many talents, Max Brooks. Max has won an Emmy for his writing on Saturday Night Live. He's the son of Anne Bancroft and Mel Brooks, whom I'm sure all of you know. And he's known as the stunt turkle of zombie writing. So thank you for joining us. Max, um, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up with Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft? Well, I think when, when being asked that question, you need a frame of reference. So, for example, you would have to tell me what it was like growing up with your parents, and then I could effectively compare and contrast with how I grew up. For example, uh, did Carl Reiner come over to your house a lot? He did not. Okay, he did with us. <laughs> uh, when you would go out to dinner with your parents, did people constantly come over and ask your parents for autographs? They did not. Okay, they, they did with us. Mm -hmm. um, did your father fight in World War II? No. Mine did. Whoa. Okay. Did your mother have to graduate uh, in the class of 1944 in a short skirt because clothing was rationed? No, I didn't know about that. Mine did. Really? So there we go. See, uh -huh. we're, we're, we're doing compare <laughs> and contrast. Uh, when you were growing up, did you have dyslexia? No. Okay. I did, mm -hmm. and so therefore my mother took all my books and put them on audiobook, went uh -huh. to the Institute for the Blind uh -huh. to have it transcribed into audio. So therefore I could listen to my uh -huh. schoolwork instead of having to struggle to read it. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. uh, so see, we have, we have a difference. Yeah, that here. was amazing that she was able to identify it when your teachers just said you were lazy. And exactly. That is uh, very did, amazing. Did your mother uh, have a vegetable garden? See? Look at all the differences. My mother <laughs> did. My mother had a big vegetable garden and she taught me how to do it. And so to this uh -huh. day, that's what I you do. Still do to, it. Yes, okay. what I do to relax. So well, there you, you go. talked about the dyslexia, and that makes it all the more amazing that you became a book writer. And in fact, yeah, didn't you yeah. write a several hundred page? book when you were like in ninth grade or yeah. a, a story? Yes, yes I did. I did uh -huh. and uh, my ninth grade teacher corrected it. Told me everything that was wrong with it. Oh. Uh, but, but I think that that's the case w with everybody growing up. Uh -huh. I mean it doesn't matter how old you get, you always remember the really good teachers mm -hmm. and you always remember the really bad ones. Oh, okay. okay. And I had, for every rotten teacher I had that thought I was being lazy, I also had some really amazing ones that taught me how to think and how to learn, uh -huh. and I'll never forget them. Okay, okay. How did you get into zombies? Fear. Fear? Fear. They're scary. I, I, I got into them by being afraid of them. Uh-huh. And, uh, and how did you become afraid of them? Uh, because I saw a zombie movie. Oh. And I thought, oh my God, what would they do to me? Uh -huh. And so I thought, well... I've got to learn how to survive in case there's uh -huh. a zombie plague. And I thought about it and I thought about it and a lifetime of being OCD uh -huh. and being into the details uh -huh. uh, combined with my, my young adulthood uh -huh. of unemployment allowed me to combine those two into writing a book. I'll be, I'll be. And, and uh, you've used what you wrote in those books to talk to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to talk to West Point yep. Military Academy. Yeah. But how, how do zombies help you talk to military men? Well, because if you see zombies as a metaphor for real disasters, uh -huh. then it's very easy to talk about what you would really do in a, in a real plague or real natural mm -hmm. disaster or a real war. Because uh, that's really good fiction writing. That's good science fiction writing. I'm not the first one to invent that. Uh -huh. uh, that used to be science fiction. There used to be a real lesson in everything. Uh, I'm sure you used to mm -hmm. watch the old Star Trek in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Every episode was about something real. So I'm just doing what everyone used uh -huh. to do and use fiction as a way to teach. Could you give an example? Yeah, perfectly. Uh, in World War Z, my book, uh -huh. I talk about the zombie plague starting in China. Well, I based that on a real plague that started in China. I based it on SARS. 
which started in China. Yeah. The Chinese government tried to cover it up, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let the World Health Organization in. Uh -huh. At the same time, China was allowing its citizens to go abroad, and sure enough, SARS started popping up everywhere, including right in North America. Uh -huh. So when I needed an effective model to talk about how the zombie plague would spread, look no farther than China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, like, what would you tell military advisors based on something like that? I, my first talk I gave at the Naval War College was about how everything is connected. Uh -huh. There are no military issues in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Military issues, war, violence, is the end result of other issues going unchecked. It, people are hungry, uh -huh. or the climate changes, mm -hmm. or there's religious strife, or technology changes, factories closing. Uh, so there's a stream of events that happen. Uh -huh. uh, Hitler doesn't just wake up in 1939 and invade Poland. Mm -hmm. There are many conditions happening in Germany in the 20s and the 30s uh, that made Hitler, uh -huh. that made World War II. And so I asked them to get out of the military mindset and look at the world as a uh -huh. whole and see what is happening in the world today that will become the wars of tomorrow. Okay, okay. Is there another suggestion for people to get out of the box and think in alternative ways? Oh, definitely. Yeah, you have to mix. Uh -huh. You have to mix with people who say things that might challenge the way you think, uh -huh. that might hurt your feelings, that might make you lose a night of sleep, that might make you feel uncomfortable. Uh -huh. You know, we used to do that as a country. We we mixed, and so we are sort of retreating into our, our little spheres, uh, maybe politically red and blue, mm -hmm. or socially or racially, uh, and we like to hear just what we want to hear. We only watch the news channel that, that makes us feel mm -hmm. good. And if you do that, you're dead. Mm -hmm. if, if every day you turn on the news and you hear exactly what makes you feel good about yourself, mm -hmm. you're doing something wrong. Okay, okay, okay. Now, one of the people you mix with is your 14-year-old son, Henry. Yes. And didn't he help you on a recent project? Yes, he did. Uh, I just did a comic book series that's still going on called A More Perfect Union, and it's science fiction. It's about what if there was a giant ant plague in the middle of the Civil War. An ant plague. <laughs> well, you remember the old movie Them with the giant ants in the 50s? I love those movies, but I wanted to put it in the 1860s. Uh -huh. So my son was my research assistant. I said, you and I, we're going we're gonna to watch a bunch of documentaries about insects, how they work. Uh, we're going to learn about the Civil War together, and we're going to combine those two genres, and you're going to be my research assistant. Oh, that's amazing. And, and he was. Uh-huh. You two must have some fascinating conversation. Well, <laughs> I mean, a as fascinating as any father does w with his son, uh -huh. because there's a limit to how much I can impress him as uh -huh. a father. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think he will have to go out into the world and then come back and say, wow, Dad, mm -hmm. you're, you're smarter than I thought you were. Uh -huh. Another one that really intrigued me is the project you did on African Americans in World War II. Two, one, World War One. World War One. Harlem Hellfighters. True mm -hmm. story. A uh, unit of African American National Guardsmen uh, set up to fail by mm -hmm. the government and went overseas and came back as one of the most decorated units in the entire U.S. Army. Uh -huh. And what could we learn from that brigade? I think what we can learn from that brigade is we're stronger together. Mm -hmm. That if we try to dice each other up, we only hurt ourselves in the face of the enemy. Uh -huh. We've got all this amazing talent and all this amazing uh -huh. drive all around the country and if we can just look past the things that divide us and all come together, mm -hmm. I mean, we'll be unstoppable. Because uh -huh. when we've done that in the past, we have been invincible. What's your newest project, Max? Newest project is a true story. It's called Germ Warfare, a graphic history. And I did this on commission from the Blue Ribbon Biodefense Panel in Washington, D.C. Really? You were commissioned? Yes. It's a, it's a group of uh, D.C. thinkers, uh -huh. like Tom Ridge, who was the first Secretary of Homeland Security, mm -hmm. and Senator Joe Lieberman, Donna mm -hmm. Shalala. Uh, they are trying to prepare us for the next era ah. of germs. Uh -huh. Germs that will come from nature and germs that will also come from people cooking them up in their basements. Cooking them up. They will be able to do that very soon. Mm. The technology is going to allow people to make their own viruses uh. and then send them into the world. Oh, great. The good news is we, we could totally be ready for it uh -huh. if we just keep doing what we're doing. Uh -huh. If we just keep believing in science, if we just keep vaccinating our children, uh -huh. if we just keep doing the kind of public health that wiped out polio 
and okay. whooping cough and all those things. Okay. Okay. Nobody can touch us. We'll be fine. Let me ask you one last question. What scares you, Max? Now. Oh. <laughs> you know, I, I think what scares me is willful ignorance. Not ignorance. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we're all ignorant. We, all, uh -huh. we don't know what we know until we know it. Uh -huh. But there's a type of personality where you say something to someone and they go, oh, I did not know that. And that's me every day. Uh -huh. But then there's a type of person that says, I don't want to, mm, mm, I don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. I do not want to hear that. That's when we get in trouble. Okay. That's what scares me. That's the kind of thinking in the 1920s when a general named Billy Mitchell stood before his court martial and said, airplanes are the way of the future. And mark my word, the rising imperial power of Japan will one day bomb our fleet at Pearl Harbor. Wow. In the 20s. In the 90s. And nobody listened. Wow. That's what scares me. Wow. Well, on that note, folks, You've got plenty of reading material you need to run to now. Fascinating man, fascinating thinker. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm Karen Bosick with Eye on Sun Valley. And until next time, I'm keeping my eye on Sun Valley for you. I'm Derek Agnew, General Manager of Zenergy Health Club and Spa. And I want to take you inside and show you what we've done with our new Pivot Studio, which is going to blow you away. The therapists tell me that Pivot really is the game changer. It fills that final gap that we were missing at Zenergy, things they could not do in our main gym. The recent addition of the Pivot Studio has meant wonders to me as a physical therapist. I can now take care of the most vulnerable post-operative patient, but now I can include programming that challenges the most elite athlete. Better food, better price, better service. Atkinson's Market, supporting local farmers since 1956. I moved out to Idaho four years ago. So I met a lot of people and, and I really, really like it here. In New York, I was always sort of introverted. When I came out here, that no longer was me. I became extroverted because the people here are so friendly and warm. You know, if you don't have something like that that brings you into other people's lives, it takes a long time to get to know people.